Hey, I'm Alex, and uh, a few people have asked me to make some deck decks. So uh, after opening packs, I really wanted to make a deck that used Men of Lang. Um, right, Men of Lang is a two mana, two power. Uh, when it strikes an avatar, the avatar discards a random card. And uh, losing cards is you know, frustrating, it can disrupt people's plans. And, you know, in terms of card advantage, one way to get it is drawing your own cards, and another is to get rid of someone else's cards. Uh, this card reminds me a lot of Hypnotic Spectre in Magic, which was a, you know, pretty uh, strong card in, you know, that game's early years. So, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's get to it. Um... So, the core cards I wanted to play were Men of Lang. Um, and they have this kind of thing where hitting an avatar does something besides just damage. And there's another card that has a similar high impact for hitting, which is the uh, Dapparil Vampire. It's a 5 mana, 4 power, airborne. And when it deals damage, or when it, uh, when it strikes, it heals you. Uh, in sorcery, you can't go above 20 life, so you can't build up a huge extra life total. Uh, but this, this can help keep you kind of buffed up towards 20. And there's a lot of really good damage spells. So in the metagame that I'm seeing, the ability to get healed feels pretty important. Um, and then uh, these cards, you know, sometimes you play them and they you know, would get killed immediately. And so I'm, I'm also pretty interested in cards that will allow a creature to strike while it's still summoning sick. Um, maybe there's an artifact I'm missing. But um, there's a grapple shot. Uh, this is rapidly becoming one of my favorite commons, or ordinary cards. It's a three mana. Uh, an ally shoots a projectile. If it hits a unit, the ally is dragged to that location and then may strike the unit. So if you, you know, have five mana, you can cast a Men of Lang, and then Grapple Shot, it'll, you know, drag a Men of Lang across the board to, hopefully you've targeted the Avatar, and then strike for two, and then lose a card at random, in addition to taking the two damage. Or, um, you know, you can get a sequence where on turn two you cast a Men of Lang, and then, you know, it's lined up where their Avatar is, and then turn three, you can kind of complete the line of sights, so that... You can then play Grapple Shot, Men of Lang, you know, move across the board, hit the opponent, uh, deals two damage, there's a card at random, and then the Men of Lang, because they're not summoning sick, because they, they were cast the last turn, can then, you know, tap and attack and deal another two damage and um, make them discard another card at random. So, you know, Grapple Shot it just offers a lot of mobility and, um, you know, the opportunity to strike uh, often unexpectedly. Um, I wanted more of this effect, so Leap Attack. Uh, it's a fire spell, four mana. An ally might take a step, and then it strikes each enemy on its location. So it doesn't quite have the same range as Grapple Shot, but um, you know, it, it can hit a number of things, so that can be useful in a different way. And then uh, Whirling Blades is kind of the, uh, the big version of Leap Attack. It's a uh, Five mana, uh, it requires two air thresholds, so it's kind of demanding. But, um, you know, an ally moves two steps, up to two steps, and then strikes each enemy along their entire path. So this um, this can be kind of like a, you know, a area damage effect. Um, and it's also just like a fine way to make men of letting or damper vampires hit a bunch of things. Uh, you know, uh, it's also with a vampire, if there are even a couple targets, uh, can really uh, refresh your life total considerably with this one. Uh, so th those are the ways of making my men of leg and my vampires hit more often. And then um, I'll talk about the other cards I'm putting into the deck. There's the, uh, the Highland Princess. Uh, this card just has a cool tutoring ability where um, she can find Philosopher's Stone or a uh, core. So, um, 
I'm playing Pathfinder, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but Pathfinder can um, sometimes struggle to get threshold. Um, so obviously you have to have the air threshold to cast her in the first place, but it can help finding a fire threshold by finding a ruby core. Um, this deck is also pretty mana hungry, so having uh, the ability to like grab a Philosopher's Stone is cool. Um, but then there's uh, Taurus Hammer Trinket. Uh, it's, a, it's an artifact that costs one, so Highland Princess can find it. And it's the bearer has plus one power at the end of your turn, return it to its owner's hand. So one reason that I'm often reluctant to play equipment on my own minions is that if they die, uh, you know, opponent's avatar can like pick them up and then you know, I've kind of given that power to my opponent, which is the opposite of what I want to do. These trinkets kind of solve the problem. Returning to your hand, I'm not sure if that was, you know, just like flavorful, like a, it's a Thor's hammer thing, um, or it was meant to be a disadvantage, but I kind of consider it to be an advantage at this point. Um, so, you know, these are great for powering up a man of Lang or a vampire if they're trying to like attack past a defender. And also can just turn other kind of like one power trash minions um, into uh, like a meaningful force. And I've also been really impressed by Battlecaster and Avatar of Earth in terms of their ability to be a unremovable threatening creature. And to an extent, these uh, trinkets can also turn your Pathfinder into something that has meaningful power and then can be combined with Grapple Shot or Whirling Blades or Leap Attack uh, to do damage if all of your other minions have um, been dispatched with. So um, this is the card I'm kind of the iffiest on in this deck, like I'm experimenting with it. Um, if I don't get enough minions and mana, they can feel kind of like a dead card and it feels like maybe I should just have something that's powerful by itself. But um, you know, I think it's important to experiment with cards to see, you know, how they perform. Um, because I think, like, too much theory crafting in your head and you can miss real opportunities to discover cool cards if you just don't try them. So, um, trying these Taurus Hammer Trinkets. Um, other cards, uh, I guess I'll talk about the Pathfinder. Uh, Pathfinder is my go-to avatar. Like, I have to have a reason why I'm not playing Pathfinder. And the reason I say that is because I want to draw a spell every turn, and I want to play a sight every turn, and no other avatar can do that. Um, and so the Pathfinder, you know, does have some serious limitations in terms of your sight deck, and I think it's important to have those drawbacks because the ability to functionally draw and play a site every turn um, means that, and like functionally draw a spell every turn, means that this avatar will have more resources to work with than other resources, than other avatars. Um, but it, you know, it takes a little work to make that happen. Um, so a card that I basically always play with Pathfinder is Magellan's Globe. Uh, Magellan's Globe uh, it connects the top and sides of the map uh, across to the other top and side. And so this can let your Pathfinder you know, go off the edge to the other edge, and otherwise your Pathfinder can kind of get trapped within a pocket of land. So the Globe's really useful for that. Uh, the other kind of effect that I think really helps Pathfinder is Link. Um, Riptide is also really good in this way, though not quite as good as Blink. Uh, both of these just, you know, you spend two mana, you can move an ally uh, to a nearby space, um, and you get to draw a card. So often, like, Pathfinder will, um, you know, kind of move up, over, down, and then, you know, it would be boxed in, but blinking allows you to, um, you know, just continue exploring new empty void spaces and putting sites in them. Uh, also, if you're on the play and your opponent, you know, if, if you move toward your opponent and your opponent moves a site towards you, you can blink onto your opponent's site and then um, kind of start exploring next to that, and that can really help um, 
trap your opponents, like limit where your opponent can play sites. And if you get like a Magellan's Globe or a couple more blinks, uh, sometimes you can like block your opponent in so that they only get to play like five or six sites max. Um, you know, not super probable, but it's a thing that can happen. And when it does, it's powerful. And giving yourself lots of opportunities for powerful things to happen is, I think, a good principle of deck design. So, um, Pathfinder's like best buddy, I think, is Wayfaring Pilgrim. Uh, it costs two, one fire threshold, one power. The first time it visits any corner site, uh, it can draw a card. So each Wayfaring Pilgrim can theoretically draw up to four cards. Uh, you know, I think the design is, if you're just moving around normally, this guy is going to like replace himself and then three or four turns later draw another card after you walk somewhere else. But um, Magellan's Globe kind of breaks this because all the corner sites are next to each other. So if your Wayfaring Pilgrim exists in a world where Pathfinder is you know, jumping between the corners to place sites and because they have the globe, and then the Pilgrims can you know, move through the sites, they can drop four cards in four turns. Um, or uh, it turns out that with cards like Blink, you can move them faster through multiple sites. Or if you want to spend a Whirling Blades on a Wayfaring Pilgrim, um, you know, may maybe powered up by a Torx Amber Trinket, maybe just for card draw value, um, you can draw several cards. So um, I, I really like the interactions between Wayfaring Pilgrim and these kind of Whirling Blades, Leap Attack, uh, grapple shot type spells that you know, also create movement um, as well as the synergy with the Pathfinder and the globe. Um, then I have Apprentice Wizard and uh, kind of if you're playing air and you're not playing Apprentice Wizard you kind of have to like ask yourself why. Um, there's a lot of spells that require a spellcaster uh, or benefit from a spellcaster and it, this, you know, this card just replaces itself or sometimes jumps in front of the creature to prevent damage. Um, I think it's just like great value. And um, you know, I, was, I was playing an NTTS match, and um, my opponent, or like, you know, someone was like, I'm just collecting foil alpha apprentice wizards. I was like, yeah, you know, as a collection strategy, these kind of very staple cards that show up over and over um, that are commons, I think the, the foils will have good value over time. Yeah, like I think um, Blink is another example of, or a Grapple Shot, like, am I playing Air? I'm probably playing four of these, and, um, you know, I think collecting those kinds of staples in foil, or probably just in Alpha, it seems like a, a good long-term strategy. Uh, okay, so I talked about, I'll talk a little bit about more about the Vampire. Um, I like that it's airborne, it limits your opponent's ability to attack it. Um, you know, that said, I still expect every minion to be killed by, you know, Drown, Berry, uh, Code of Fire. Um, so, uh, playing creatures almost always feels a little bad, but um, at least these can't be, like, attacked by other creatures. Um, unless they're, you know, airborne or have ranged. And that, that gives them, like, a little bit better odds of being around the next turn. Um, but uh, yeah, this is just like so much life gain, which is potentially very exciting. Okay, uh, Dream Quest. This is another one of my favorite cards. Um, I was informed that uh, avatars can no longer become disabled, so an avatar cannot go on a Dream Quest, so you need another spellcaster. Uh, the, I think this card is so strong that it's one of the reasons that if I'm playing Air, I play Apprentice Wizard so that I can play Dream Quest. Uh, it does create some challenges in that you need to protect the Apprentice Wizard um, so that they can complete their Dream Quest. So having an Apprentice Wizard that's like somewhere out of the way, or um, you know, maybe you've gotten lucky and your Men of Lang have made your opponent discard the Lightning Bolt, that would have solved the problem. Um, but, uh, you know, putting some thought into maybe having another creature around to protect it so that, you know, someone's like using Lightning Bolt, it's like 50-50 whether they disrupt the Dream Quest. But, um, yeah, like, I like this card quite a bit. 
I, one of the sites I'm playing is another favorite of mine that shows up in a lot of my decks, which is Standing Stones. It makes it so any minion here is a spellcaster, and this will uh, be something that makes it so that any minion can go on a dream quest. So you know, maybe you can have a beefier minion like a vampire go on a dream quest. Though uh, that just, you know, I think the vampire was already a big target. Um, but like, you know, in this deck, uh, Stimming Stones doesn't make huge value, but like making a Highland Princess able to go on a dream quest also seems good because there's not a lot else she can do. Besides, I guess, uh, pick up some Torhammer's trinkets and get to work. Um, and then I guess the other card that really cares about spellcasters is Pact of the Devil. Uh, you know, I often play Fire and Air together. I feel like they have a lot of card drawing between the two of them. And, um, you know, Pact drawing three cards and Dream Quest tutoring um, just feel like really powerful utility effects. Uh, so, you know, I often use the Pact with the Wayfaring Pilgrims, or with the uh, Apprentice Wizards, and they sacrifice themselves to give me, you know, three more cards. Uh, also, you know, something can be standing on the Standing Stones and draw three cards, which I think is nice. And, you know, sometimes with the Dapper Old Vampires, it's clear that I'm going to be able to regain a bunch of life. And um, sometimes it's just, you know, pay half my life, even if I'm at 20, because I'm about to have my vampire pick up a Taurus Hammer Tricket and, you know, whirling blades into a space, and I'm going to get 10 back, so paying 10 life is no big deal. Um, which I never thought I'd say in Sorcery, but I guess I'm saying it now, so that's cool. Uh, Browse is a card that I'm not really sure whether it's a good idea in this, um, this deck or not. And the reason I say that is because it requires three error threshold, and um, the Pathfinders, yeah, I think one of its main weaknesses is that um, it, since it can only play one of each site, it, uh, and you don't really, like, you don't have a handful of sites, so you, you don't control their order. It can take quite a while to get to three air threshold. And um, I think if I wasn't playing, like, Highland Princess with Amethyst Core, so I had, like, a third tutorable um, threshold, I wouldn't play this card. But, like, that's how close it feels mathematically about whether this card's a good idea. But it's so powerful, like looking at seven cards and getting to choose the one that you want um, helps you find the right thing at the right time. So I don't know, I'll probably, I'll probably end up cutting it for something that's easier to cast, um, but I'm not sure what that is yet. So for now it's Browse. And uh, like I was saying about the trinkets, like I think it's important to test cards that you don't know. And I think it's also important to like test the limits of your mana base to see if you know, you can cast things, and maybe Matt says it's hard, but maybe it turns out that, like, casting Brows on turn six is totally fine, and it's just such a powerful card that even though I can't cast it early, I should keep it in my deck. Uh, so I think, you know, I've talked about Grapple Shot, Leap Attack. Yeah, so that's all of those. Um, you know, Philosopher's Stone, uh, I don't always play it in decks, but... Uh, because this deck is mana hungry, like I said, you know, setting up, being able to cast like a mana blank and a vampire and then, you know, cause them to strike before my opponent plays something to neutralize them is important. So, um, Philosopher's Stone is a great source of recurring mana. Uh, the trinkets we've talked about, the Amethyst and Ruby cores, um, both provide acceleration and help with threshold. Um, I think it's okay to play cores that are off your um, your threshold needs. Um, in this case, I thought about it, and um, maybe if after I've played a bunch, I think that I you know want more acceleration, I could put them in. But I also like worry about getting two more, um, you know, too many more like dead drops. Like I think one of the best things about the Pathfinder is that you're just drawing live cards. Um, every turn, and um, so yeah, like maybe more cores, maybe not. Um, I think I need to play a lot more before I figure out whether off off threshold cores are a good idea. And then we talked about the globe. 
So now I'll move into sites. And even though I talked about most of the spells first, uh, what I usually do is think about like, approximately what spells I want to play, and then I build my site deck first. Um, just because like, I think sites have huge impact on like, how your strategy can work. So um, Pathfinder basically demands that we play any dual color or dual threshold site we can. So I'm playing the color out of space and pristine paradise. They both have you know, significant drawbacks. Um, and uh, you, know, you, can, you can place these in unlucky places where it's either easy for the other player to you know, take away the voids from the color out of space, or you're kind of like trapped into your own pattern where either you have to take a turn playing off, off playing a site or you know, close in your color out of space. And you know, like they can put stuff on pristine paradise, etc. But I, I still think that the capacity to make two different colors of threshold are important enough to making um, the Pathfinder work that you know I think I'm playing them. Uh, Ruins is the dream. Um, you know, makes both, both colors of threshold, doesn't really have any drawbacks. Um, and I named the deck after runes. I, you know, I, I've seen the naming convention. People are like Fire, Air, Pathfinder. Um, I like finding something like a little more thematic. So um, I named it after the runes since it's basically you know, like a Fire, Air book. And um, yeah, it's a ruins Pathfinder. Okay. Uh, I played one of each of the Ordinary Towers. Um, you know, they're a source of air, uh, their genesis effect of if this is the first one of its type that you've played, you gain one extra mana, can give you turns that are just a little more effective. So I kind of like the way that the Pathfinder's drawback synergizes with the tower's limitation. Uh, like, I would play more towers if I could, don't get me wrong, but it feels kind of nice that, like, you know, the towers always work. Um, and then I just needed other sources of air, so I chose um, you know, cards that seem to have an effect that might be useful and wouldn't hurt me. So Cloud City, the ability to move around can sometimes be really nice for a Pathfinder. Um, observatory, uh, you know, I think Observatory is at its best when you have tutor effects that let you uh, kind of reshuffle the top of your deck. So it's very synergistic with Highland Princess, like the dream is you play Observatory, you put like either one or two cards that you want on the top, and then, you know, the next turn or the same turn you draw that card and then you cast the Highland Princess to, you know, reset your deck and shuffle away the cards that don't work. Uh, I think Observatory is better if you can play more cards like, com you know, Common Sense or Highland Falconer and have more ways to reset the top of your deck. But, um, you know, at worst, it's just giving you a little extra information and choosing the order your cards come in, which is fine. You know, it's, it's better than just playing, um, you know, let's say a, a dual color site that wouldn't have any benefit and might offer some vulnerabilities to an avatar of Earth or a water-based deck with their you know, drown effects. Um, and then uh, Watchtower. Uh, I don't really think that stealth units are a huge problem, but, um, you know, taking away stealth, why not? Uh, it's better than nothing. Uh, this is all to say that uh, I, you know, this deck fundamentally would like some more error sites to be printed so that it, um, it had more kind of utility things that were a good fit for it in air. But, um, you know, limited, limited first set. You do what you can. Uh, then uh, we're moving to fire sites, uh, each of the generic deserts. You know, in general, I think it's hard to make the deserts pay off when you're not playing any kind of direct damage. Um, and also, it's hard to make them pay off when you don't know when they're coming. So, like, I like deserts. Uh, they're kind of at their worst in this deck. Uh, that said, they're, they're better than no effect when they come into play. You know, sometimes you do get to kill something that has one power. 
or you know stack the damage from the desert with the damage from a whirling blades or something. So you know um, it can pay off. Uh, Dwarven Forge. Um, I think that the fact that anyone can conjure things here uh, isn't much of a drawback because one, most people aren't playing any weapons or armor, and two, like unless they already have a minion standing here, um, that's not that useful for them. Like because you can pick up anything that they summon here. Um, whereas for you, like you know, if you can summon your own summon minion here and equip it. Um, and this deck is actually playing some weapons, right? The Taurus Hammer Trick, oh, is it? Uh, I don't know if the Taurus Hammer Trick is a weapon, if I need to look that up. So either there's a synergy here where the Trick Kids are free, or um, maybe Dwarven Forge is a blank, and I should replace it with something else, because maybe there's some downside. So I'll look that up later, and I'll put a comment on the video. Um, River of Flame. So, uh, I love this place, right? Uh, it counts as a fire spellcaster. Um, I wonder, can it cast Pack with the Devil? I think it can. And I kind of have this fantasy that at some point, um, I'm going to be playing with someone and they're going to have some cool minion standing on top of my River of Flame. And my River of Flame is going to make a Pack with the Devil. And, um... I'll sacrifice it, and it'll destroy everything on there. You know, I don't know how many games it will take before that actually happens, but um, I think it'll, that'll be a fun moment for me. And, um, you know, I, I feel like most opponents will be like, oh, yeah, that was clever. I will, might never trust a river of flame ever again. Um, so, yeah. Uh, smoke stacks up Gnac. Uh, you know, this is... Um, I was looking deep in every atlas to find things that might be interesting. And uh, it makes it so that other nearby sites lose their abilities. And, um, you know, like I said, we don't care a ton about the abilities on a lot of these cards. Um, but a thing that is really cool is Pristine Paradise and the Color Out of Space their abilities that they would lose are the ones that make them make no mana or threshold. So there's like some chance that you randomly drop your smokestacks of knack next to those and um, and then they don't have a drawback, which seems very cool. Um, and then, you know, these can just like turn off things like floodplains or bedrock that um, maybe someone was building a strategy around um, and... I think that you're more likely to we're more likely to get value out of like turning other people's stuff off randomly than be hurt by this um and it has some upside for us so yeah um all the times i've played it so far it showed up in a nice place um i'm sure at some point it will do things that are annoying to you but i'm cool with that uh vesuvius um you know i think this is just like a very solid fire site um, kind of like my River of Flame fantasy, where I'm like, you know, I want to sacrifice it in the Pact for the Devil. Your opponent has to think really hard about whether they want to stand here or around it. And it just makes their life difficult while giving you a powerful knob that you control. So um, I put Vesuvius in basically every fire deck, uh, unless I have a really good reason not to. And I think it's a really nice card. Um, Mirror Realm. Uh, so this card makes a copy of other sites. It doesn't help you get your first threshold, um, but can help you get your second threshold, um, or later. And, um, you know, it offers some selection because it can copy any nearby site. So if your opponent is playing some of your threshold colors and they haven't shown up because it's super early, maybe sometimes uh, exploring with the Pathfinder near the site that has the threshold that you want. Mirror Realm can work out. Um, also, you know, I think that effects like Observatory or um, Crossroads, which we're going to talk about in a second, you know, being able to re-trigger it is useful. Uh, I'm not 100% sure this is a good choice in this 
um, book, like I can imagine that hitting uh, several uh, no color threshold lands at the beginning is a possible sequence and like that might be disastrous. Um, maybe I'm supposed to have more air threshold. Um, so this is like a maybe and if I keep on running into this situation where I don't have enough air threshold fast enough, I'll probably replace this with something else that has more air threshold. Uh, Crossroads, on the other hand, I'm pretty sure is like pretty good in here. Um, you know, the Pathfinder has no information about what they're flipping unless they play Crossroads. So if you hit a Crossroads, you have a pretty strong chance of getting, you know, whatever specific threshold you're looking for. And for that brief moment in time, you can make plans for the next turn with like, you know, confidence about what's on top of your deck. And, um, you know, also like being able to sit for something useful like a tower um, or like smokes an axe and knack at like the right moment is also cool. So uh, I like this card quite a bit. Uh, standing stones we've talked about, I mean, just mostly here for synergies with um, Dream Quest and Pact with the Devil. I can imagine taking this out, like maybe I play a bunch and I'm just like, oh, I always have an apprentice wizard. I don't need more spellcasters, and I would really like more colored threshold. But, you know, I wanted to test what this in here because right now it seems to me that maybe the limited resources spellcasters, and I want to make sure that I have them. And then uh, the last site here is Sinkhole. Um, I think that Sinkhole is very good for the Pathfinder, uh, other players. Like, essentially, sites are more expensive for them because, you know, they had to spend a draw step getting them or spend an avatar action to draw them. And um, if, like, since the Pathfinder is likely to have a lot of resources, trading resources one-to-one -one is usually advantageous for the Pathfinder. So I put Sinkhole in here. Um, and, you know, once again, it's one of those things where if I play this deck a bunch and I find that I don't have enough air threshold and, you know, Mirror Realm seems like it's good at making threshold, um, you know, I'll figure out whether I need to, like, cut Sinkhole or Standing Stones or both. In general, I think Sinkhole's more powerful than Standing Stones. So, you know, I think I'd probably try to preserve this Sinkhole more. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, that's the deck. I think I've talked about all the cards. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to hit me up in the comments. Uh, if you like this video, subscribe. I'll probably make more videos. Um, I really like sorcery and you know, have a bunch of ideas after I've been opening booster packs. So um, hope you have fun, and I'll talk to you another time. Bye.